let's open with a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. You confess your sin to get back to spirituality. It's not a salvation issue, 1 John 1, 9. It's a spirituality issue. The indwelling Holy Spirit is the great teacher of uh, the ability. He, he brings teach and recall to your life. Uh, that's very important because some of us get into a place where recall uh, gets tough, and there, there he is to do it for you. That's, that's phenomenal. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. So I give you the privilege to do that before we start study. Mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, and overt sins would be three categories to examine. And make confession. Well, our Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. We're so thankful, Father, for the people of our church who to participate in uh, breaking bread on Wednesday by bringing uh, foods so that other people can eat it in a hurry as we give them one hour program here on Wednesdays a lunch break. Uh, hopefully people will bring clients and friends and neighbors and family members and especially those who find it difficult to drive at night for Bible study. This is uh, their time. Uh, Wednesday from 11.30 to 12.30. I pray for Ronnie Deloach today with his uh, uh, artificial leg problem. I pray, Father, that you'd give uh, healing to Ronnie and wisdom to the medical staff around him to be able to treat him. Uh, we thank you, Father, for all the grace that's been provided us that we can list in our hearts and mind to thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in 1 Corinthians 1. I want to take a look at verses 11 through 17 today. And Paul asks an important question that becomes the topic of my discussion today. Is Christ divided? And the answer should be no. But the Corinthians had to answer it yes. And that's a big problem for the church when they have to answer that. Is Christ divided? In verse 11. We're at verse 11. That says, let's see, make sure I'm in chapter 1. Chapter, 1 Corinthians 1.11. For I have been for informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people. That was one of the groups. You're going to find that the church at Corinth had been divided into four groupies. And Chloe's group has written about it, that there are quarrels among us. Now, I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of all. Another, I am of Paulos. Another, I am of Cephas, or Peter. And the other group, I of Christ. And so the church has, has been divided into four groupies. Followers of followers. Then Paul asked three questions. Watch this. Watch this. He asked three questions. Has Christ been divided? Paul speaks for himself in the group. Some say, I am of Paul. He says, for any group that might be following me, I was not crucified for you. Or were you baptized in my name, the name of Paul? The answer to those were no. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Caiaphas and Gaius, that no man should say you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the household Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech. If you want to know where that really stung his soul is Athens. He went into Athens, well, the intellects and tried to be intellect rather than to be basic with the gospel of Christ. 
And he said, I'll never do that again. But to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, that the cross of Christ should not be made void. That's where I'm going today with this discussion. Our lesson text comes from the Chloe section of 1 Corinthians. You know, the book of 1 Corinthians is divided into four groups of questions. And the Chloe section, we call it the Chloe section, is chapters 1 through 4. And Paul is responding to that group. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, he writes, by Chloe's people, that groupie, and probably followers of Paul. They're writing to Paul. That there are quarrels. Iris. Like the flower. Iris. And here we have rivaling strife. Among you. Rivalry strife. So let's take a look. At a homiletical outline I've given you. By three points, in verses 11 and 12, the problem is stated. The problem is iris, in the English called quarrels, which actually is rivalry strife, which is a mental attitude sin. What it amounts to, what was going on in the church, is petty, petty parson. Partisanship, groupies, okay, partisanship, divided into partisanship, the church into four groups. The, these these would be groupies, followers of followers, or groupies. Now the problem wasn't with the communicators, the problem was not with the communicators. Paul, Apollos, Peter, called Cephas here. And whoever I of Christ is, whoever that, no specific person, they just are going to follow the teaching of Christ and they're not really interested in any pastor teacher. But there was no problem, as, as you will read in the third chapter of Corinthians, there was no problem among the guys. The problem was among their followers. And Paul says, I have none. I don't have any. I don't have any followers. If I do, I don't encourage it. And you shouldn't be a follower of me. I didn't die for you. Isn't that simple? You should follow the one who died for you to take away all your sins. You should be a follower of Christ. You shouldn't be a follower of any other person in the church. You shouldn't be a follower of Ron Adema or Colonel Thame or whoever you want to point out. None of these people, including myself, died for your sins. So Paul makes it kind of simple. This is how you figure this out. Okay? Okay. The second thing in verses 13 through 16, he asks three questions and then gives his personal opinion about those who are following him. He identifies the problem, is Christ divided? Merizo is the word divided. Notice it's a perfect passive indicative. The perfect tense says, these groups should be disbanded. <coughs> the perfect tense. The division must stop. Because this division, once it gets started, will last forever, and it will divide the church. The church is one body. It is one church. It's not a bunch of churches. The way the, the one body is divided is into local churches who are of the one body and of the one mind. And of the one mission. And so he identifies the problem about Christ being divided. And who is doing the dividing? It's not Christ. It's people. 
they've picked who they're going to follow. You don't follow somebody that didn't die on the cross for all of your sins and the sins of humanity. That's pure and simple. Is Christ divided? The answer should be no. But it was yes in the church. They had, been, they had divided themselves into four groups, right? And he lists them. These are groupies. When he asked the three questions, the first one expected yes, and the next two expect no. He says, has Christ been divided? Yes. Paul was not crucified for you, was he? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. I made sure. Anybody I baptized wasn't baptized in my name. They're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't know where you're getting to follow me. You don't follow me. All great teachers run into that problem, and they have to discipline themselves not to allow it. I can remember a day well, under Colonel Thame when they wanted to create a denomination under him, a denomination under him. And he said, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. You know why? Because of 1 Corinthians 1 forbids it. So he went, listen, he went to the pulpit, began to teach out of 1 Corinthians. You don't do that. You follow the one who died for your sins and all the sins of humanity. That other stuff is craziness. You're just a groupie. Now, I like what Paul does. Paul speaks on behalf of Paul, not on anybody else. He speaks on, on behalf of Paul, I can tell you, disband. Stop that foolishness. Now, I can't speak for Peter. I can't speak for Apollos, and I don't know who this other group is following. <laughs> I can only speak for myself. But as for myself, don't do this. Right? Don't do this. And then he tells you why. He says, this problem distracts from the central one message of the gospel, which is the cross of Christ. Look at verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, he sent me to preach, not in cleverness of speech, that the cross of Christ should not be made void. So we're, today we're going to look at this idea because this is what's happened to Christianity. 21st century Christianity has become this very thing. Point number one, rivalry strife, which was happening to the church called Iris, was the manifestation of walking in the flesh, like in Romans 6, 12 through 14, well worth your read about carnality. Walking in the flesh is walking by the lust of the flesh, the sin nature. It is walking in carnality. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. It, rivalry strife is personal sin. It's mental attitude sin. Strife. In Romans, the 13th chapter, 13 and 14, Paul addresses, he said, let us behave properly as in the day. Not, and he gives three categories that the Romans were having problems with. Three categories. Not in carousing and drunkenness, that would be the whole drug business. Not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality. That would be that whole deal. Not in strife and jealousy. There's our problem at, in Corinthians. Right? Strife and jealousy. Note the not in. Sets up three categories of personal sins. Not in. See the not in three times? He says, here's the solution. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And when he says this, he puts it in the aorist middle imperative. The imperative IMPV is a command. It's an aorist command, which is a strong command. I'm not asking for your opinion. I'm not asking for a debate. I mean, I want you to get on to this right now. I want you to do this without hesitation and not with a lot of overthink. The middle voice says, I want you to do this yourself. That's the middle voice. Put on. It means to clothe yourself with Christ, like in Galatians 3.27, which, which the Holy Spirit has done for you, and now you must do for yourself. Ephesians 4, 22, 23, put on the new man in Christ. Then he gives a second command. He changes it from the heiress to the present. Be sure you note that. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh. No, make no provisions. A present tense, middle voice. Stop doing this. And it's an imperative. It's a standing imperative. In regard to the flesh or sin nature lust. If you want to know how the sin nature lust works in your life to develop personal sin, you should read James 1, 14 and 15. That will give you the mechanics of how it works in your life. Then you could read Galatians 5, 16, 17 that tells you only the indwelling Holy Spirit can control the flesh. And he talks about, in Galatians, what people miss in Galatians 5, 16, and 17 is the war of the lust of the flesh. He says, there is lust of the flesh and there is lust of the spirit and these two are at war. You must learn the difference in your personal walk with Christ, the difference between the lust of the flesh and the lust of the spirit. Now, most of us learn a lot about the lust of the flesh and nothing about the lust of the spirit. That's why it's so hard for you to walk in the spirit and so easy for you to walk in the flesh. These people are walking in the flesh in Corinthians over rivalry strife. Point number two. The problem they were having in the Corinthian church was coming from followers of followers. When you become a follower of a follower, you're in trouble. Because you're not following Christ. And you will both fall in the ditch. This rivalry strife was causing division in Christ that in the church, the division in the church became the division of Christ. There were four followers of followers, factions. There were the followers of Paul, Apollos, Cephas, Peter, and then Christ, some group called I Follow Christ. It was creating rivalry, strife, division in the Corinthian church, according to our lesson text. Paul says this is simple to resolve in your life. This is very simple. Did the person that you're following the teaching of, did he die on a cross for your sins? Then there is your balance. You need to be a follower of Christ and not a follower of followers of Christ. None of these four groups Leaders had died on the cross for the sins of the world, John 1, 29. Only Jesus Christ is the Savior of the church body, Acts 20, 28, Revelation 5, 9. And he is the, and he is the only head of the saved body, the church. That should pretty much solve it. He's the Savior of body and the head of the church. 
and he's the one you follow. Every church age believer is a follower of Christ because of the gospel of the cross of Christ. It was Christ who died for all of our sins. And it is through that you are incorporated into the church body. And he is the sovereign head. He's the sovereign head of the church. He doesn't share that position with anyone. He shares it with no one. And the reason he's the head, because he died for the sins of the world. And when he was raised from the dead, ascended back to the Father, he was seated at the right hand of God the Father as head of the church. He's the sole savior of the body and the sole head of the church. And he doesn't share that, doesn't share it with me or anybody else. My gift is no different than yours as a gift, only in its identity and function. Every other spiritually gifted communicator of the church of Jesus Christ is a follower of Christ. Just like every other spiritually gifted church age believer is a follower of Christ. I don't have any standing to the head than you do. I don't, he doesn't consult me. We don't have conferences. Well, Ron, uh, this is the way you're, since you're the head of that local church, I'm not the head of that local church. He's the head of every local church. He's the head of every local church. The pastor's not the head of the church, nor is the board of deacons. In Revelation 5 9, it says the church is made up from every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. He's the savior of it, and he's the head of it. The rest of us are followers of Christ. You always are a follower of Christ and not a follower of a follower of Christ. Every church age believer is a follower of Christ and not a follower of man or men. Jesus Christ is the only one who died for mankind's sin. That's how simple it is for you to understand. Only one person qualifies. You follow him the one who died for all of the sins of the human race. In Hebrews 9, 12 through 15, he tells you that he died once for all and created eternal redemption and therefore is the mediator of the new covenant. I'm not that. Not Paul. Not anybody. None of us with the gift of communication ever earned that status. Nobody. Point number three. Spiritually gifted communicators like Paul, Apollos, Peter, and whatever group is following, quote, Christ, must understand that the church body consists of sheep belonging to the great shepherd, the Son of God. We're all sheep. We're all sheep. We belong to one flock. He is the chief shepherd. He is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Christ is the one. Christ is the one. The rest of us, as communicators, are just harlings. We're the under shepherds of responsibility, like Jesus in John 10, 11, is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Lay down my life for the sheep. In 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2, he's the chief shepherd. I'm an under shepherd. I shepherd his flock. And if I do a good job, I'm promised the unfading crown of glory. 
because I keep my stead under authority. I am under the authority of Christ, no different than you. I have a different gift with a different function and a different responsibility. I'm a follower of Christ. Do not be a follower of Ron Adema, nor anybody other person. 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2 is a great read for you. He covered this with Peter after his resurrection, before he ascended in John 21, in that famous dis discourse, Peter, do you love me? Then he told him, then take care of my sheep and my lambs. And he called him the under shepherd. He called him the pastor. Jesus Christ is not only the chief shepherd, he's the good shepherd. The one who laid down his life for the sheep. The Corinthian congregation had their favorite pastoral teachers and was making an issue of it within the church. It wasn't based on the word of God. For all of these men that are listed as men taught New Covenant grace, categorical Bible doctrine. You can read their books. Now, we don't know if Apollos wrote, but there could be maybe good evidence that Apollos actually wrote Hebrews. But we're not sure. But we know Peter wrote, we know Paul wrote, and we got a, a possibility that he was written by Apollos. If so, all these men understood their role as under shepherd. They all were followers of Christ, as all sheep should be. You follow the great shepherd. You follow the good shepherd. Therefore, be it a follower, therefore, it must have been based. Then what were these people basing it on if it wasn't on the word of God? They were all teaching the same thing. Then why were they growing into groupies? Well, apparently, it was based on other things like personality, appearance, manners, and delivery. The method of delivery. What else could it be if they all taught the same truth? Then apparently it has to do with appearance, personality, manners. Something that's not, not essential and not important. You understand that? I mean, why do you come here? It should be to learn the word of God. To make you a better follower of Christ. That's why I come. The doctrinal point to be learned in this, that it is not the man, it's the message. Right? Now, oh, you've heard that all your growth life. It's not the man, it's the message that carries the truth of God's word. The one who feeds the sheep for growth. Do you love me? And feed my sheep for growth. Do you love me? You don't have to love the sheep. You have to love the shepherd of the sheep. Now, in his own capacity, he would be smart. The communicator would be smart to learn how to love him as Christ loved him, right? Yes. He said to Peter, do you love me? Then do what I tell you to do. If you love me. Out of your growth, you learn to love the sheep. But let me tell you, if you love the sheep and don't love Christ in the supreme position, you love Christ first and then the sheep second. Well, then go read John 21. I mean, I'm not here to convince you. I'm here to teach you. <clears throat> Listen, even Jesus had this problem with his disciples. One example, 
they wanted him to teach on prayer and fasting like John the Baptist and the Pharisees. Isn't that interesting? They had the greatest teacher ever. And he wanted him to change like the cultural system that they were familiar with. Isn't that interesting? Followers of John the Baptist and followers of the Pharisees called disciples. You can read about it in Luke 11, 1 and Matthew 9, 14 through 17. Listen, they felt the way about his teaching in parables. They got after him for teaching them all the time in parables because it took too much energy for them to think for themselves. A parable always had a doctrinal point, and you had to really pay attention because it was over, over here in this one hand, and then the other hand was the truth. So he gave you this, and then he, you had to figure it out to get it. And that was just too hard. He's just too difficult. He just teaches this way and that way. I know. You actually have to pay attention. You have to figure something out. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's difficult. And so they chided him about that. Luke 18, 34. They said, we just don't get it. When you teach in this disguised manner. Look. <laughs> Jeez. A bunch of Hebrews. If you study the Old Testament, it's full of narratives. Narratives. The life of Joseph, the life of Abraham, the life of David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And boy, does he expose it. None of us would like to have God write a story on our life because he tells the whole business. Oh, David would have liked to have that whole chapter on Bathsheba taken out. He could have threatened every historian that was writing on David's wonderful career, except when God writes on it, he tells the whole thing. Man, who would want that? Don't write about my life, God. I don't need to have that. I'm trying to get it cleaned up. You, know, you rattle that cage, all the skeletons fall out of that. Holy catfish. And comprehend. In John, the 16th chapter, 29 through 31, he actually says, listen, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be tried on a criminal charge. They're going to crucify me. And three days later, they're going to bury me. And three days later, I'm going to be raised from the dead. They said, now you're talking plainly, and we understand. And they hated every time he preached plainly, and they hated it. They they want to go back to parables because they, you're too morbid. You keep talking about dying. Well, I am in just a minute. They're never satisfied. Listen, you don't teach to itching ears or forum. They may wind up in your class, but that's not who you're trying to please. In fact, you're not trying to please anyone in the congregation with your messages. You're trying to please the Lord. And if you're not, you might as well close the book. Paul asked the congregation an important question. Is Christ divided? The correct answer was no. All right? It shouldn't be. The correct answer is to be Christ. But was it? Was the church divided? Yes. It was divided into four groups for sure. Is, the, is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? No. But was his church divided? Yes. Should it be? No. And how was it divided? It was divided into groupies. You, we, we understand groupies, don't we? Now, point number four. Today, 
in, in the world today. The church in the world today. Today, the one body of Jesus Christ, the church of Acts 20, 28, has been divided into denominations, groupies. They differ on certain doctrines. You know who they are? Followers of followers. For example, the followers of Peter formed their own denominational church after his death. They made a ritualistic religion out of it in the world. Later, the followers of Luther, who broke from it, formed the denomination called the Lutheran Church. And now, we have many divisions called denominations of the one body of Christ. Do you understand that? That's what Paul was trying to avert. As a local church, Doctrinal Studies Bible Church, we broke with denominationalism in hopes of getting back to one new covenant foundational doctrinal one church body. And we have not been successful. For we have groupies in our church. <laughs> I've had them ever since I started. I'm of theme. I'm of Ron. I'm of him. I'm of him. It is the kiss of death for a church. A divided church won't stand. It will, form, it will form out and form another weak limb. Do you understand that? We broke off in hopes of getting back to the new covenant foundational doctrines of a one local body of Christ. We didn't want all those trappings. All of those great. Let's just go back, take a good solid look at the foundational structure of a church, and let's be that church. We've tried really hard to do that. Yet we've been criticized for it and appear to others as a cult because we are out of step with denominationalism. Some people can't stand the pressure, so they've gone back to them. <coughs> and unfortunately, we're not structured well enough in this church to live another generation. We're having, we're having no growth in a second generation. We're having none. And when this church finally disbands out of necessity of no more people or money to operate, you know where all these people will go? They'll go back in denominationalism. That's where they'll go. Because there's no doctrinal church with an idea of what the original church should be. We've become so denominational today that we think that's the norm and standard when it is what divides the church. Under the angelic conflict, it is defeat, not victory. The church of Jesus Christ today in the world has become followers of followers and not followers of Christ because they've divided themselves up into battle squares. There's more fighting within than there's fighting without. We're in a peck of trouble. We have fought 45 years with this banner. 45 years. And, and, and we're in trouble. We are in trouble as a church because we're not able to appeal to a second generation, either that or we're not willing. And you've got to have that for this to continue. We're not denominational. We never will be because it divides the one body of Christ, which we 
we are de designed by to fight against. Do you understand that? Paul is fighting this issue. This is what Paul is fighting. My message to you today and to me. While it seems impossible today because denominationalism has divided the church up into so many sections and grown to be accepted culturally that it seems impossible to ever get it back to where it belongs. But listen, that was true of Phariseeism, Phariseeticalism in the day of Jesus Christ. And the church came out of the gospel of Christ. Didn't come out of it. Didn't break off with Phariseeism. Started itself. The book of Acts began a whole new chapter. Which is called the new covenant and the church age. And the epistles of the teachings of Christ. It started from the ground floor so to speak. And we're in the battle of our life. We're in the battle of our life. Because denominationalism is so strong today that they view us as a cult. When we're trying to be the real deal. And it seems so foreign to the average person. Well, you don't do this and you don't do that. No, we don't do any of that. Well, you don't do this. We don't. No, we don't do that. How is it that you don't do that? Because it's not scriptural. <laughs> we do as best we know what is scriptural, and we don't do anything else. Well, but you don't have this, and you don't have that, and you don't have this. And you know, I know it's not scriptural. We can't find it in the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, and we can't find it structurally for the church, we don't do it. It's not our responsibility to do that. This was what Paul was trying to stop. Is Christ divided? He is not. But is the church? Yeah, it is. Yeah, we've, we've broken off into groupies and we don't know how to come out of it. And the temptation is to go back. What are you going to go back to? What are you going to go back to? Well, for some of you, you won't go back to anything. That, the, where's your fellowship? Where's your fellowship with the body of Christ? What are you going to do? Well, I go back for fellowship. I hear this all the time. Well, Ron, yeah, I go to a church, but I just go for fellowship. Why would you leave a church that offers you both? Well, it's just not convenient. What do I know about it? Okay, let's have a word of prayer and we get out of here. All right, well, Father, we thank you today for, for Paul. Paul really addressed a big issue really early on in the church. In the 50s and 60s. 30 years after the church was in existence, he was fighting this battle because of the angelic conflict. And here we are, Father. We now live in a day in which it's the norm and standard. And when you bring this kind of argument on the floor, you get booed off. But it's the right thing. There is only one body. Only one body, and that is Christ. We are followers of Christ and no one else. No one else. No one single person. We're not a follower of Peter. We're not a follower of Luther. We're not a follower of anybody except Jesus Christ. And the New Testament was written for that. He is the mediator of the new covenant. This is what we're all about. So, Father, help us understand it. Help us Help us understand the importance of the life of the church and how desperate it is 
that we be of one mind and one body in Christ. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.